Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the machine learning.net community stand up. Uh, today we have office hours again, so um, it'll just be Jake and me here to answer all of your questions. Um, we'll go over some community links. We're going to talk about the upcoming releases of ML.NET and Model Builder, um, as well as talk a little bit about what we're working on next. And yeah, just feel free to ask questions throughout. And um, we will, you know, as we start talking about some of the future stuff we're working on, we'll, we'll ask questions to you all as well to answer in the chat. Um, so yeah, so let's get into community links first. And um, I will post in the chat the URL first, the URL list, so you can follow along. And yeah, so just a few links this time. It looks like um, community content is slowing down. Um, we definitely love to see you all coming up with some new stuff as we come out with new stuff. Um, but yeah, so the first thing I have here is a beginner's guide to machine learning using ML.NET and .NET 5. So this looks like it'll be a series and this is part one. So again, there's a lot of great getting started guides out there. Um, and this one, you know, is it's pretty in depth as well, talking about what is ML.NET, what, what can you do with it? How does it stack up against other frameworks um, and how you can get started with Model Builder? Um, and I think this is just, you know, the sentiment analysis example. So the, the hello world of machine learning examples here. But um, if you still haven't had a chance to, you know, get started with ML.NET or are still learning, this could be a good resource there. Um, and this one is um, by Hamad. And then, um, so we, the ML.NET team partnered with the Windows machine learning or WinML team, or I guess the Windows machine learning partnered with us. And they wrote a, um, created a video and wrote a doc about how you can um, create an image classification model with ML.NET and then cons uh, consume that in Windows machine learning. Um, so you can take a look here. Um, Adele wrote this article from the Win Windows machine learning team, uh, wrote a, there's a, a doc tutorial on it and then this, this YouTube video as well. Um, if you missed the virtual ML.NET community conference, uh, one of the um, one of the talks we had was about Formula One strategy with ML.NET. So Michal did uh, that one, uh, and this also did a blog blog post on it. So this is part four of it. You can uh, go back and see you know part um, parts one through four here of how using ML.NET to predict um, Formula One strategies. So this is a super cool use case. Um, I would also recommend going back and watching the recording from virtual ML. .NET community conference, but if you like to read more than you like watching videos, um, then take a look at uh, his blog post here. And then um, from our favorite, one of our favorite community members, John Wood, uh, he created, he did a live stream of how to use ML.NET to score a TensorFlow text classification model. So a lot of times when we talk about uh, scoring or um, consuming TensorFlow models, it's usually, you know, image classification um, types of scenarios, but in this case, it's text classification. So he goes through, there is a, um, there is a tutorial here. So if you haven't seen it, um, he goes through the tutorial and we'll show you how to do it. And then, um, last community link here. So <laughs> goodie or baddie. <laughs> so this is an image classification scenario of, um, using ML.net to predict whether an image is of uh, someone who is good or, or like a villain or a hero, essentially, a goodie or a baddie, as Lee calls it. Um, so this one was just published a few days ago. Um, super interesting use case. Talks about bias a little bit as well, which is which is um, really important. Um, <laughs> and it looks like, you know, in the end, the, the model predicted correctly. So check this one out um, if you want to, you know, predict superheroes versus villains um, using image classification. And so that is our community links. I posted the URL list in the chat um, for everyone, and I'll bring it back to Jake and me. Uh, so yeah, so Jake, how about we get into um, what's coming up in this next the next updates? I guess I'll start with ML.NET um, real quick, and I, we've mentioned this in past um, past standups, but. ML.NET, this, this upcoming release, technically you can use it right now, but we're waiting for the official release. Um, Long-awaited ARM support. So with ML.NET, you'll be able to perform training and inference with ML.NET on ARM64 
um, and Apple M1 devices. And this enables platform support for you know, mobile and embedded devices as well as ARM-based servers. Uh, so that's really, really exciting. Um, Louise, who unfortunately cannot join us today, was able to get it running, was able to train on his Pinebook Pro laptop, um, which is running Manjaro, Manjaro, Manjaro ARM Linux distribution. So um, I have, that'll be in the upcoming blog. I have some screenshots from that. Uh, so yes, so that's super exciting coming up with ML.net. Um, and then the release should be sometime this week or next, and there'll be an accompanying blog post as well. And along with that, we have our model builder release. Uh, Jake, you want to talk about some of the things coming up in model builder? Sure. So I think we may have had this on the show a little bit. Maybe not. I don't remember. <laughs> We've had we a did, lot of yeah. <laughs> but, um, we, we have a, a new thing called our MB config. And so with the, with the MB config, we're hoping to make it so that you can start working collaboratively. So before, you know, when you were in model builder, uh, you would go through the training steps, and if you wanted to try and get back to one of the pages, like the evaluate screen or something like that, to try it out, or the consume page to regenerate your code, um, you would actually have to retrain all the way from the beginning. So that doesn't make much sense. Instead, we are now following models that hopefully you're already familiar with, with WPF and WinForms and things like that, where you there's a there's a file that represents some some state. That's our MB config file, and then there's a uh, there's a code behind file that's generated once you once you finish your training. And so what that allows you to do is you can check in that MB config file and you know share it with your teammates, download it on, on, on their machines, and hopefully, you know, from their Visual Studio, they'll be able to just load it up and, and get that same state again. But within your, your same machine, um, you know, we're hoping to unlock a lot of opportunities with this. One being, you know, now that we have this state that we've saved. Hopefully, if you want to train longer, you know, in, in, in the upcoming releases, we're hoping to, to light up the ability to just add more time so that you don't, if you, if you train for 100 seconds and you realize that that wasn't enough for your model because it's a complex problem, you'll be able to just, you know, train for an additional 100 or 1,000 seconds. So that way, we still give you that, you know, quick getting started experience where you can train for a short amount of time, get a model, get your training code, integrate it into your application. But then when you want to, actually train longer when you want to see if you can get a better model. You can then go back after you've you know built up your confidence in using this model in your application and see that the code paths work and all of that. You can go give it you know 10,000 seconds or you know many days, whatever you want to do for for training and, and try to get a better model that way. So will this also allow you to stop training early? Say you know you've set the training time for 10 minutes, but then you end up getting a model that's you know 95% accurate in the first minute and you want to grab that model. Because right now, when you hit cancel training, you lose all progress. So will this enable um, being able to st you know, stop training whenever you want and then being, being able to grab that model? Totally. So yeah, also because we have that state, just like we said, you know, we'll be able to, in, within Model Builder, you can just click stop training. So as soon as you have one model, if you click stop training, uh, you'll, it'll generate the code. You'll be able to continue. So if you, you know, accidentally said 10 days <laughs> instead of 10, 10 seconds or something like that, you can, you can click stop. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're really excited about it. A lot of the, a lot of the changes that we made are behind the scenes. Um, so, you know, we're excited that we, we have delivered some value here in, in this release, but the long-term value of it is we'll be able to light up a lot more features in, in Model Builder and the CLI and in Azure training. Um, so this is just just a, a little bit of what we can unlock with this. The, the really you know big work was sort of how we changed you know which AutoML we're using, how we're saving state, all of that, and that's going to unlock a lot of opportunities in our, our tooling going forward. Yeah, and with the MB config, that also um, opens up the possibility to bring the MB config into the CLI, and you can kind of interchangeably use Model Builder and the CLI. Um, that which is going to be you know especially important if you work with people that are not um, using Windows or don't have Visual Studio or just for um, CI/CD retraining type purposes, um, which is something else we're working on is our ML Ops story um, integrating into CI/CD you know through um, Azure DevOps GitHub Actions um, so that's something that we're currently working on as well um, and also just you know being able to help with. Uh, or make model deployment as easy as possible. I mean, right now it's already pretty easy because you're using .NET. So, you know, if you have your project with your model in it, you can right click publish. But um, we also are trying to help get you started with the right code and templates. For instance, um, in the, this coming release of Model Builder, um, we've added these project templates, which are kind of the, the starting code 
for consuming the model. It's meant, it's not meant to be sample projects. It's more meant to be like the starting point that you can actually like templates so that you can actually use them in production. Um, so we have these minimal web APIs, which I think we've mentioned in the past. So you'll be able to, at the end of training your model, um, generate a minimal web API that has your model as a part of it. And then you can, um, you know, modify it how you want or just have it as is and then right click and publish um, however you want to. So, so yeah, um, and it's Christopher has a question. Um, could it be possible to train a model on, on Blazor WebAssembly in the future? Um, actually, it is possible now with some limitations. Um, and in the upcoming blog post, which should be, ne uh, come, be published next week, we will talk about some of those limitations, um, but it is currently possible for some scenarios. And I'll try and find, I have a link somewhere um, that actually has some examples of that. So that's a great question. And Christopher, I'd love to know like what scenarios, like why do you want to be able to train in Blazor WebAssembly? Uh, if you feel comfortable posting that in the chat, we'd love to hear, hear about that. And then also looks like it is Manjaro. Thank you. I don't know how to pronounce this uh, name, but <laughs> thank you. You're on an infinite for... loop of uh, pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, but thank you for that because I wasn't sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, what else do we have? Uh, maybe talk a little bit about AutoML. We don't want to spoil too much, but maybe tell a little bit about AutoML and the improvements we made. Sounds good. I also wanted to go back to oh, a little bit yeah. to the to the Azure thing. So um, one of one of our goals is is that is to get like going back to those sample projects is, is we want to start guiding people on, on potential um, avenues they can choose from. So Azure is really powerful, but there's a lot of options. Like even just deploying a model, we you can do it as a web app. You can do it as a Azure function. Um, Azure ML has their own way of publishing a model and getting a REST API. And so what we want to do is, is, you know, from our tooling, give you one happy path it's not going to be the only happy path. You can, you know, try to integrate it into your your applications. However, you're you're currently familiar with, you know, deploying .NET code. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna work with you know internal teams and try to get figure out what is you know the recommended happy path and guide you towards it, so we make it really easy for you to onboard to Azure. For sorry, what was what was the next topic? Uh, no, I, the next topic was AutoML and oh, talking yeah. about some of our work there because I don't even think we've really talked about that on the stand-up yet. I don't think so. Uh, we actually, so we did have a guest a little while ago talking about um, about AutoML and how they used AutoML. So if you're not familiar with uh, AutoML and why you might want to use it, I think that our, our prior community stand-up did a, a good like introduction to AutoML. But, but we use AutoML to power all of our tooling. And so that's another big effort. Uh, sorry that we've, you know, had sort of a a gap here between our releases, but we've been we've been working really hard uh, to deliver value here. Um, so we've been working with two teams from MSR. Uh, if you they they both have open source projects. Uh, if you want to see kind of what, how their their work is or try to find their papers, so the two projects are Flammel and NNI. Um, we worked with them. Um, you know, one team has 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 a fantastic architecture that we kind of followed and, and it helped us uh, sort of match the industry standards of, of how to do AutoML. And another team had some novel techniques for um, how to actually approach AutoML and how to navigate that search space and pick which which model is the best model. And so for the, the novel techniques, uh, I think next episode, we're actually going to have uh, Oh, thanks for posting the links. We're actually going to have Chian to to talk about what those techniques are and how we integrated them into into ML.net. Um, so first, our first step was actually just integrating them into our tooling. In long term, we're hoping to to integrate them into uh, the framework itself. So in, into ML.net itself, so that you can you know customize your own search space, do a code first approach of AutoML. We we did talk a little bit about you know why people might want to do a code first approach versus a tooling approach AutoML. Um, in that prior episode, and um, ultimately, you know, these partnerships that we built have have set us up for success in terms of leveraging the 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 best you know AutoML techniques we can find out of out of MSR and, and and the public. So hopefully, we'll we'll get that into open source soon, and you can even contribute. If that's something you're really passionate about. Um, but yeah, yeah, and it's interesting because these teams before only used Python, right? Mm -hmm. So this is like 
you know, they're, they're entering the world of .NET. <laughs> and that's been, you know, it's, a, it's been beneficial on both sides, I think. Um, and it, it's a really awesome partnership and we, we really look forward to continuing to work with them. Um, but we did post in the chat that they are both open source projects from Microsoft Research, MSR is Microsoft Research. Um, so feel free to take a look at that. Um, so Suraj, we have a question. Keep getting errors while using data from Azure SQL with GUID primary key columns, model builder error. Um, Jake, do you wanna talk about, have you seen this error before? Wanna talk about this? I have not seen this error, but I do, I think know what's causing it. Um, could you open up an issue in our, our repo and we will we will take a look at it. I know that um, our AutoML and our, um, and, and how we, set up our, our I data view for, for training. I think we really only support like single Boolean, um, a few more, but I know we have a very small subset in SQL. I have sort of a dream for SQL where, you know, one day you'll be able to just write your own, um, your own query string to, to kind of kick us off. And in that you would be able to do some, um, some casting and stuff like that. Uh, if you want, you can try. I'm not sure if it'll work. You can you can try converting um, it to string in the advanced settings, uh, but I think that's only an option right now in um, our preview release. So we might need to to give you a preview release. So you might need to wait until till next week, where until we actually release, um, or try out our preview release. And you could you could try setting it to string because uh, the GUID should be able to be parsed to string, um, and if it's an ID, um, you should be able to just ignore it. And then that would also exclude it from the query string. Um, but definitely, definitely open an issue. So we make sure that we give this a try before we release next week and hope, and then we'll work to try and resolve it before, before next week for you. Yeah. And uh, feel free to reach out to us um, as well. If you uh, have questions or want, access to the private or it's not private the, the preview that we have um there it's it's just there's a few instructions you have to follow because it's a private NuGet feed um but yeah feel free to reach out um, on twitter or i guess tw linkedin <laughs> either of those um and we can we can take a look as well or and we can send you the uh preview instructions awesome so christopher uh responded as well about the, the blazer web assembly um, scenario. So we talked a couple of months back, but it's essentially object detection. And I currently have it on an API where I post a picture from a client, but it would be cool to do it on the client directly instead. I think I vaguely remember, because I remember we asked in a previous, um, in a previous community standup about scenarios for Bla Blazor Web Assembly. I see you thinking. <laughs> yeah, I I'm thinking. So for, for object detection in particular, we don't have, um, we're still working on, on lighting that up in ML.net. Um, I'll have to, I actually haven't really thought of the, the Blazor WASM story for our, our deep learning story yet. I think usually, you know, deep learning is such a, a complex and uh, computationally intensive thing that um, I was more thinking object detection would be, would be done sort of in like an offline situation uh, and more inference would be done in WASM. But let me, can you actually open up uh, an issue for that as well in the in the model builder repo? Um, and I'll pull up that link to the model builder repo. Sounds good. Thanks, Bree. Um, just keeping it on our radar. I, I think we're working we're working with Torch Sharp. Actually, we might be talking a little bit about a deep learning in, in the mm -hmm. in a couple of minutes here. But um, we're working with Torch Sharp, and and I know that it, it depends on the Torch native libraries, and I'm not sure where all of those are available or if it would be um, an option. Uh, so this was Christopher's follow-up. Hmm. Uh, so right now our object detection consumption relies on Onyx. Um, but going forward, our, our training story and our deep learning story is gonna be more reliant on, on Torch Sharp, I think. Yep, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, and we have a question here. So <laughs> is model builder still in preview version? So this is a very interesting question. <laughs> so yes, we are technically still a preview feature. So model builder is still a preview feature. You have to go into tools options, preview features and enable it. Um, and then there are, and the, our latest version was a, in a even 
more preview um, because it was a lot of experimental type stuff with the MB config and the new auto ML. Um, so that will be on a public Nougat feed as part of the main model builder releases next week. Um, we are working towards model builder GA. I believe right now what's um, the only thing between us and GA are some compliance things. Like there's a lot of different, you know, to get into Visual Studio, there's a lot of different compliance checkpoints you have to have, you know, for accessibility, localization. Um, so we're getting through those checkpoints. And I believe as soon as we're done with those checkpoints, we'll be officially GA um, and you won't have to, you know, enable the preview feature. But Jake, is that correct? <laughs> Yeah, I think we're actually through most of those compliance checkpoints um, at this point. The I think we're currently targeting like the Dev 17 timeframe. Like I'm really hoping that with uh, sorry, I guess that's the next Visual Studio uh, for people that aren't aren't on our, our internal names for these things. But um, so in the next Visual Studio, I'm hoping that we we GA so that we're never preview in the next Visual Studio, um, and we just release as a as a GA version. Yeah. And are there any other things that you're hoping to accomplish before we're GA or is it just the compliance things? I think for me, a little bit of it is, is, is stabilization. So we're, we're releasing uh, this version of, of Model Builder and it introduces a lot of new things with the MB config and such like that. We've been testing it a lot. In fact, we, we brought on a, a dedicated tester to, to really help make sure we, we deliver solid here, but ultimately a solid product here. But once we, um, once we release it to you, you guys are always great at finding edge cases and we want to give it some time to, to stabilize and make sure that the MB config meets your needs, that it meets your collaboration needs. Um, so I would say it's just a little bit of stabilization um, is kind of the, the main the main thing here. Yep. And then once we are GA, we, can, we will still probably have preview features. Like for instance, um, our Azure ML training is technically a preview feature still, right? Because those components are of Azure ML were still in preview. Um, so that will probably continue to be the case going forward, but we'll, you know, still be GA and, and Mod Builder itself will be, um, you know, stable and compliant and everything. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, kind of a long answer to it, but um, yeah, so no more questions it looks like right now. Um, so let's start talking about deep learning. Uh, in our most recent survey, uh, which we went over the results a few community standups ago, uh, lack of deep learning support was one of the top pain points and blockers, which makes sense. Um, and yeah, so we are starting to, not starting to, we're continuing to develop our strategy for deep learning and our plans moving forward. Um, so here are our thoughts so far, um, and you'll start to see these plans out in the open soon. Um, one, we want to enable Torch support, specifically being able to consume Torch models. So right now in ML.NET, you can consume um, TensorFlow models and Onyx models, but not Torch models. So we want to or add the ability to consume PyTorch models through ML.NET. Um, we also want to enable our users to build neural networks from scratch. So I think uh, we have a question here from Flippy. Are there any plans to, to build customer networks like RNNs, LSTMs, et cetera? So yes, we want to enable people to be able to do this. And maybe Jake, do you want to talk a little bit about the Torch Sharp stuff and, and how we want to enable this? Sure. Um, so we're, we're partnering with a few people from within in Microsoft for this. So if you take a look at the NNI project, they actually um, already have um, some neural network architecture search stuff in it. Um, so I think you can take a look at, at kind of how, how that works um, over there. We're hoping to, to kind of light that up um, with TorchSharp being our, our main, you know, underlying uh, framework that we're using. So you should be able to do anything it, it, with TorchSharp that you could do with PyTorch. Um, I'd actually love to learn more about, you know, what you would like to do with your your custom network and see if our, our plans kind of align with it. I'd say right now, you know, because our tooling is sort of scenario focused um, and, you know, everything we've been doing is sort of scenario focused, we're, we're still sort of leaning towards um, scenario focused approaches. So if you can tell us like what your scenario is and how, um, you know, something like, like transfer learning or just consuming an existing, you know, pre-trained model doesn't, Meet that needs, or how you know your your custom network might be better. Um, you know, one 
one case I've heard uh, is that you, know, you can get smaller models or simpler models um, by doing custom custom networks. So let us know how you how you want to use it, and we'll start. We'll keep shaping our plans to to make sure it meets your needs. But I think that we are. Um, it's definitely in our in our in our plans to um, support custom custom uh, deep learning models. Yep, and that'll enable, like Jake was saying, we're very scenario focused, and so that will enable things like or I guess easier NLP, local object detection training, which I know has been asked for quite a bit. So to open up all these scenarios, but we definitely want to know what scenarios are most important to you, um, and why, like Jake said, like why is consuming a, a pre-trained model from PyTorch not like, does it work for you? Is it because you don't want to train in Python and you want to do it all in .NET? Um, or why won't transfer learning work in your case? Um, so let us know. I, I put up here the our GitHub link to our uh, to our repo from for to all of our tooling. Um, so you can let us know there or you can reach out to us directly. Um, we're starting to do talk to a lot of customers to understand some of these things. Um, so then Duh, duh, duh. Let's see, we've got a few things here. So Flippy responded, price elasticity models with several features and time series components. Um, okay, cool, so that's that's one scenario. Um, when we're also working on our time series kind of scenarios or um, and, and improving upon that, I know with time series forecasting right now, we only have one, um, one algorithm. And you know, that's a really huge business use case. And I think, uh, Oh, I've seen Arima's models are being asked for a lot and such. So we'll definitely, we can um, take a look and we'll, we'll note that would be. Um, then we've got this question. Is there an optimization toolkit specifically for quantiz quantization? Quantization? Yeah. <laughs> Deploying integer only models. I don't think we have anything like that. Uh, I, I might redirect you again, again to our model builder repo if you can. Um, point to like existing tools and how you might want to use them. We're we're definitely noticing that our user base is getting more advanced, and as a result, we're going they're going to be asking for more advanced tools. Um, so we are excited to kind of explore that area and see what we need to unlock for for .NET developers. Um, so yeah, if you can if you can kind of share in the the model builder repo what what you would use that for, and um, you know what scenarios it's currently blocking, and we would we'll look into it. Yep, and then we other um, users and customers can also comment and let us know on that um, if you file an issue. All right, so Roche asks, during training the model with about 1,500 rows, I keep getting training time finished without any models trained, no matter how many times I train it, um, specifically using multi-class classification. <laughs> um, so we probably have a few follow-up questions here for you. Um, one being, so it's multi-class classification. Um, what is, so it's going to be very dependent on what your data looks like. Could you maybe t tell us a bit more about the scenario? Um, what, another one is 1500 rows doesn't seem like that many rows. So you might just not, you might not have enough data. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit more about your data, if it's not, you know, uh, sensitive, um, we might be able to help you out a bit more. Jake, you have anything to add? Yeah, it's also possible that you, you know, hit an error that, didn't that we didn't bubble up properly if you can take a look in the um, the output window there there may or may not be more information uh, and if that doesn't help guide you towards you know what's maybe going wrong i know we have had uh, oh it looks like somebody said okay perfect if you can if you can share one of those similar github issues i think i'm tempted to tell you to try the the new preview release so we've done a lot of a lot of changes there um, but next week it'll be going live, so you can try next week's release, and I think that should should perform better. Um, I wouldn't expect it to take five to thirty minutes, and especially not with our new release. We our our new auto ML um, does a lot of cool novel techniques to get you to a model really quickly and iterate on it. Um, so I would expect you to be more successful with our future. Yeah. So it looks like Soros was looking at um, a. Uh, the data set is similar to the GitHub issues sample. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, so that there's not an issue out yet, but it's similar to that one. So some sort of classification similar to the GitHub issues sample. Hmm. Um, I would say, so. I mean, there's a few different things. Like like Jake said, it could be an error that just wasn't, that we didn't catch and didn't bring up in the UI. Um, it could be that you don't have enough data. It could be that it's, um, 
that it's unba an unbalanced data set. Um, and, you know, since it's classification, maybe it, you know, doesn't, you need more of each category of each class. Um, so yeah, like Jake said, it shouldn't take that long for 1500 rows. It seems like either it's an error we didn't catch or the data set isn't quite there yet. It also might have a lot of columns or like a lot of different mm -hmm. categories that it's trying to classify against. We'd have to know a little bit more about that um, mm -hmm. as well. And yes, I'll send a link to a form for the preview release. If you fill it out um, now or after the show, I'll, I'll send you that email of, of how to how to get started with it. Sounds good. I think I'm also inspired to keep saying try the preview release. Um, I think we'll try to get something into the like we'll update the preview channel to have our latest uh, release candidate uh, soon after this stand up so that you are, are trying the latest bits. Um, and then hopefully either by the end of this week or early next week, we'll actually release it to everyone. So. And let's see, Oop, I lost the video feed. Here we go. Um, so a few more questions here. Um, so Jose, hi Jose, nice to see you again. Um, does ML.NET use TensorFlow or PyTorch under the hood? If not, which one is used? Uh, yes, specifically for our image classification API. So for training custom image classification models using TensorFlow, that, use, that runs on top of TensorFlow.NET, which is um, C-sharp bindings on TensorFlow. And that's part of the C-sharp stack, which you um, asked about, Jose. Uh, do we participate in C-sharp stack development? So we did work with the C-sharp team um, to, to enable this scenario and, and create the image classification API. Um, and we also work with them for other things. Maybe Jake, you want to talk about a bit more of the collaborations we've done in the past? We had Hai Ping on actually, um, who's, um, work, is on the C-sharp team or, uh, and works on tensorflow.net. He was on one of our previous community standups, but Jake, do you want to talk a bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we definitely rely on them for some of their expertise. We when we updated to use the latest version of um, TensorFlow.net, there were some changes that we had to collaborate with them. So so we work with them. Uh, we haven't done like at least my team hasn't done a lot of direct contributions to uh, the C# -sharp stack yet. We are investing heavily in in Torch Sharp, uh, and that's kind of what we're hoping to to build a lot of our our tech on. Uh, it's kind of you know, within Microsoft, we're doing a lot of investments in Torch, so we're trying to um, sort of focus our energy there for the time being. Um, but we definitely don't want to, you know, discourage anything in TensorFlow.net. We're hoping to always keep those scenarios working strong for, you know, being able to consume your models and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... Okay, are there any other questions? So anonymous user said, transfer learning based models would be very nice, like NLP stuff, like Q&A, enemy extraction and summarization. Um, yeah, that's so right now, like I said, our image classification API uses transfer learning, um, but that's I think the only area right now in ML.net that, that does use that. Um, but it is totally possible that we can continue using transfer learning for other scenarios as well. And on the on the NLP front, there is um, some open source projects that have started using BERT. We're that's kind of on our long term roadmap to figure out what our our, our BERT story is. We know it's really popular for for NLP. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot what some of the other other topics that you had there, but um, oh, so sorry, I can. I don't know. We're just here. I'm not uh, have anything to touch on there. I think NLP was the main one, but yeah, Q and A. Yeah, um, and entity extraction and summarization. Yeah, totally. Um, so we have a recommendation for Sarosh from DF Mara, which maybe your label column has too many categories for your data. Yeah, that's that's totally a maybe as well. Uh, one of the issues. Um, so Sarosh asked about, are there any samples of multi-class classification other than the GitHub samples issue? Uh, we should have a few. Um, let me check our um, samples repo. Um, and then our tutorials. We should have a few more. Um, if we don't, then we will definitely add them. So yeah, we have um, Iris Flowers classification as well as um, MNIST, which is the handwriting one. So I'll post those. So 
I just posted the samples repo there. Um, and yeah, so I posted the samples repo so that you can take a look at some of the other multi-class classification examples as well. Um, and you said it has 15 unique values. So for 1500 rows, that might be too many values, um, especially if you only have a few in each. Um, but yeah, it's uh, that, that could be one of the issues. Take a look at some of the other examples. Um, and then again, like we said, we, you can file an issue and we, we can take a look, um, especially if you're able to share your data with us, we can, um, re we can talk privately there. Totally. Yeah, it's hard to know. There's there's lots of variables that can make things work or not. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that I, I actually, if you're using the latest public release, I actually don't remember all of the state that that's currently in. I know there was a an issue related to sparse data sets, so it's possible some of your um, for some of your rows, some of the columns are blank. Um, we've since resolved that, but you know, depend. So I, sorry, my brain's kind of in the in the latest version. I don't have the state up there for for what the last public release was. Right. Um, okay, so coming back. Oh, someone says I made the BERT Q and A implementation you mentioned. Well, anonymous user, if you have a, if that's you know open source or shareable, feel free to share the link. Um, that would be really cool to be able to sh to share. If not, in the virtual com virtual ML.net community conference, there was also an example of using BERT. Um, so let me find that for you. Uh, there's a few links I owe you, the private preview and then the um, BERT model one. So I'll, I'll search for those as, as we keep answering uh, more questions here. There is one question up above uh, from three oh. minute noodles. Or it's not really uh, more of a statement, but I'm yeah. happy to talk about it. So. Um, yeah, this is a this is a cool cool scenario, especially kind of the edge edge devices. The um, I'm currently working on sort of a prototype with with PyTop. Uh, Diego from the I guess the .NET Interactive team kind of uh, lured me into the the PyTop projects, and so at some point in the future, I'll kind of talk more about the the PyTop project that I'm working on. I want to light up a scenario where. You know, I have this little little robot. It'll go through the house, try to find my my dog Denali, and, and take photos <laughs> of it. So hopefully, we'll get that working. Um, it's it's just going through that process has taught me a lot about you know what what folks might want on on those different uh, devices and where we're potentially lacking. Uh, one of those areas being, you know, I want to do image classification or object detection, and our Onyx uh, libraries aren't available on ARM thirty two, but like the Operating system for those things um, is, is ARM32 by default, so it's fun for me to go through those projects. If you have another device or you're hitting, you know, specific issues on those edge devices, please open up issues either in the ML.NET repo or the Model Builder repo. Um, we'd love to, you know, get get more asks from people. It helps us when you know trying to work with our our partner teams communicate the importance of something. Um, so if you're hitting any issues on those edge devices or anything like that, um, or have requests there. Definitely post an issue in our repo, and we'll use that to try and try and push to to get the features we need. And that's our uh, actually. I'll switch over to the .NET one. Uh, so that's our uh, repo right there for the tooling. And Sarosh, you can uh, file an issue there, like a, a initial issue, and then we can reach out. We can send you our email so that we can um, figure out with with the specific data set. Um, or if it's one that you can actually share, you're, you can share it on GitHub as well. And Jose has asked, could you recommend some deep learning catalog sites like ModelZoo? Really, ModelZoo is the only one I'm super familiar with. Um, I, so Jake, do you, I, I bet Louise would, would know this one really well. <laughs> but any Louise, ideas? Louise, how dare you take <laughs> I some know. time off? Uh, no, that's great. I'm glad he's, <laughs> he's able to get some time off. Yeah. Um, so Jose, if you save that question for next time, I'm sure Louise will be on and we can we can inquire about that or we can do our research beforehand, uh, some more research on that and, and let you know. Um, any other questions that I missed here? I don't think so. Um, so. So yes, who can you get in touch with? That's us too. So. 
if you feel comfortable, file an issue on our GitHub. Um, we're also both on Twitter, or no, sorry, Jake's not on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. You can reach out directly to me there and I can send you my, my email um, or LinkedIn as well, if you search my name. Um, so you said that in the link, you have samples for all types except multi-class classification. I'll share my screen so I can show you uh, where those multi-class ones are. Um, coming back here, sharing. Da, da, da. Um, so right here, multi-class classification uh, in the samples repo. So here's one that you were talking about, that GitHub issues one. Here's one with the iris flowers. So that's a pretty um, classic one. And then um, the handwriting one is here as well. Um, another place, let's check docs real quick. Um, we have a lot of tutorials, so I can't ever remember the specifics. Um, I'll make my screen a little bigger here. Um, so we've got tutorials for API. I believe it's the GitHub sample, the GitHub issues one. So yeah, categorize support issues. Um, so that's going to be the same one there. Although there might be some some tips or pointers there. And uh, and then here's another one actually categorizing health violations. Um, here, so I'll send this link as well, which is a, another example of multi-class classification. So Saroj, hopefully that helps. Um, there's a few more than just the GitHub issues one. And back to us. Uh, and Jose, when will be the next session? So we stream every other Wednesday. So in two Wednesdays, um, we weren't here two Wednesdays ago because of build and occasionally um, we have to skip a few, but normally we'll be on every other Wednesday. Um, so someone said they came in late. What is a VOD of this broadcast? What does that mean? Is that like a recording? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Video on demand, maybe? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so those are, they're all on YouTube. If you go to the .NET, um, foundation, I believe it is, but I'll actually get the link. So it's YouTube.net foundation. And they have a whole, I don't know the lingo for YouTube, <laughs> like channels. And um, I think it's, uh, no, I think it's the .net foundation channel, right? And then they have different groups. And one of them is a community stand up. So or playlist, that's it. It's a and I'll kind of let me share my screen again. Um, so here you can see all the different playlists. So in .NET community standups, if you go to view the full playlist, maybe, <laughs> um, here are all of the .NET ones and the machine learning ones are here. Um, another way that you can do this actually is live. I always go to live dot dot live dot 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 net, <laughs> which shows um, what's coming up and all of uh, the channel nine stuff and all the dot net stuff. Um, so you can see this is the one that's currently playing. But if you go to the right here on the dot net community stand up, um, this will also have all of them, but you can actually filter them here. So if you give it a second, my computer doesn't like sharing live streaming, sharing a screen and sharing video. Um, so if you go to category and put machine learning, it will show all of the, oh, it's starting. This is so meta. Okay. So, <laughs> so then you can see all of the, the past shows and the, the recordings. So I'll, uh, I'll post this link here, um, which you can go to to look at past recordings. Cool. I did see a question above. Um, you, C sharp for implementing YOLO five. Uh, I have never tried, <laughs> but I believe that you should be able to in Torch Sharp. So I'd say give it a try in Torch Sharp. If it doesn't meet your needs, um, file an issue over there. We're going to be looking in the future at ways to make um, you know Torch Sharp and ML.NET more compatible and easier to use together. Um, so that's why I'm kind of encouraging you to go use Torch Sharp. I imagine that in the future, the plans for you know migrating from Torch Sharp to whatever our, our story ends up becoming for ML.NET directly will be compatible. Um, so you won't have any effort lost there. And that's the uh, Torch Sharp project, the, the repo to that. OK, so somebody commented <laughs> that you're getting ready for the after party with all the bottles back there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, 
I, this needs that one Teams feature of, of blurring your background, but yeah, <laughs> always, always ready for a party, so. <laughs> and I think uh, Louise had one time on a stream, like a pair of biker shorts hanging, and I had a friend who was watching the stream and they're like, is that underwear in his stream? <laughs> so always be wary of what you have in your background when you're live streaming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then, okay, we have, what else do we have? Thank you for all these questions. These are awesome. Um, let's see. When we use C Sharp for ML.net, oh, Jose. When we use C Sharp for ML.net, it, can it be faster than Python? Uh, yes, so there's an experimental evaluation um, comparing training and testing. Um, so it, it was comparing the accuracy and the runtime for, between ML.NET, Scikit-Learn, and H2O. And um, it found that ML.NET was able to train on the full data set. So when the data sets were really large, say for sentiment analysis and regression, uh, ML.NET was able to train to completion because of the way that it, it streams data while training versus Scikit-Learn and H2O were not able to, they ran out of memory because it loads all the data into memory. Um, then when uh, doing subsets of the data set so that all of them could finish to completion, uh, ML.NET had a uh, higher accuracy and a lower runtime. So I will link to um, that experimental evaluation as um, I'll add the link to that and you can take a look at, at the specifics of it. Um, and then a community member wrote an article and we had it on the community stand up a while back of inference. So um, comparing inference of ML.NET and PyTorch. And they found that ML.NET, and of course this was not like an official, you know, benchmark testing or anything, but it was it was very interesting to see that ML.NET was faster inferencing on CPU, um, but, but PyTorch was a bit faster on GPU for inference. So let me get you a few links here. Um, so here's the um, experimental evaluation that I'm posting right now, uh, typing in the chat. Usually I have Louise here to, to help me add all these links because we all we know where all the links are, but um, that one should should give you the experimental evaluation. I'll try and go back and find the, the PyTorch evaluation, um, but that was an article from before. Um, yeah, I think I think Brie, you touched on all of it, but I, I, I think that um, kind of the key key piece that gives us sort of a performance gain is that that streaming, right? So it's just how we move move objects around. Um, we're very intentional. We make very few copies, um, where some of the some of the Python things don't. Um, so I mean, we're not. It's not like magically faster. A lot of most of the algorithms that we use are the exact same algorithms um, that are used over in the other other libraries. Uh, so. The, the key gains are kind of, you know, just in, in how we, we move the data around. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Roberto, when will we add new transforms like image rotation crop? Because at the moment I have issues to use ML for training and need to train with Keras then convert to an Onyx model. So that's, I, I believe, going to be part of our deep learning story that we were talking about earlier. Um, so especially let us know which are the most important transforms. I mean, we'll, we'll obviously take a look at the um, industry standards and, and, and take a look at um, what are the most common in general. But if there's something specific that you want to see, let us know. Um, and once we start to implement our deep learning, uh, that will we'll have more transforms like that um, for images for, uh, for deep learning. And so that way you won't have to go to Keras and then back into ML.net, we're hoping to um, be able to do all of that in ML.NET. Uh, there is right now in the SciSharp stack, so in TensorFlow.NET project, there is a TensorFlow.Keras, I think they call it. Um, so you, I, I haven't been able to try it out myself, but um, you could see if if you're able to use that. Um, I'll, again, find the link for that uh, for you. Um, but that might be something interesting to check out there. One, one thing is you mentioned that you you convert to Onyx. Uh, we do have um, TensorFlow inference available in our repo as well. So you shouldn't necessarily need to convert to Onyx. I know that there can be some gains to con uh, converting to Onyx as well, um, but just a, a slight note there that you, you might be able to just use the Torch model directly or the TensorFlow model directly rather. Um, so was it, has there been a study of MLNet versus Scala? 
Not that I know of. Um, yeah, I, I don't think so. But if you find something out there like it, let us know. Um, or if any of you want to take that on, <laughs> then definitely let us know. But nothing that I know of yet. Um, anonymous users. So the only thing with Tort Sharp is the name and conve conventions. Is that going to change? Uh, could you elaborate a bit more about what about the naming conventions you don't like or are confusing? And Jake, do you have do you have opinions on this? <laughs> Sorry, I actually had a phone ring, so it's just okay. <laughs> um, yes, so with with Tort Sharp, I believe that the sort of uh, operating principles are actually similar to what um, some of the the C Sharp libraries are doing, which is we want to we want to make it so that the APIs are are actually similar. Like we're kind of sticking with what they have because there's already a lot of documentation. Um, for for PyTorch, and we want to be able, we want our our users to be able to leverage that 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 Torch community that already exists. So if we make a lot of changes to the APIs and how they're used and all of that, um, we'll have to create all of our own documentation, and it'll always be sort of you know lagging behind. Where right now, you know, you can just leverage what the community has already built for for PyTorch. So that's kind of you know one of our operating principles. <clears throat> um, so hopefully those things don't change. the The key thing. Um, that, that we're offering with, with Torch Sharp is more just the, the C Sharp bindings onto that, that same, um, you know, C or C++ based um, native library uh, Sharp. So the, the key thing is just, you know, being able to interact with it from, from .NET uh, without having to, to go through Python first. Um, so I think I answered everyone's questions so far. If I didn't, feel free to post it again. Um, or if you have any other questions, post them in the chat um, in these last 10 minutes. We thought this was going to be a shorter one, but I'm glad that we had so many awesome questions. And uh, hopefully you all are excited about the stuff that we're working on. Um, something else we're working on, which I haven't mentioned. Uh, we have a few interns, which is awesome. Um, one of the interns is working on, her name's Jessie. She'll be on probably in the not the next uh, community stand-up, but the next one. She's working on model explainability. So um, if you might already know that uh, ML.NET offers two model explainability features. One is um, PFI or permutation feature important. So determining which features uh, affect the final uh, model the most. And then also FCC feature calculation contribution, which is more of a local explainability feature. Um, we've gotten the feedback and that they're not easy to use. And then I've tried it out and I know it's not easy to use. <laughs> so um, Jesse is working on um, improving that experience and seeing what other model explainability features um, are needed at ML.NET, as well as how we can kind of make, make ML.NET more responsible in terms of responsible AI and how we can help our users with that. Um, and then we've got Melissa who um, is working with Jake and Melissa is another intern who's working on uh, interactive notebooks in ml.net. Um, and we're, uh, you might've heard previously that we're, we're we've been talking about adding interactive notebooks to Visual Studio. Um, so that's something that we're trying to prototype now. And once that, once we've got that working as a prototype, we'll let you all know so you can try it out and let us know if it makes sense in Visual Studio. Uh, we recently did a user study um, where it seemed like if Visual Studio People want to stay in their primary IDE for notebooks, and you know, obviously for a lot of you, that's going to be Visual Studio. Um, so yeah, so we'll continue our work on that as well. And Melissa and Jesse are doing an awesome jobs, so hopefully they'll both be able to join us on the streams in a few weeks. Um, what else is there? Anything? I mean, we're working on a ton of different things. Um, Jose asks, is there available course for SciSharp? That I'm not sure. Um, you might, yeah, I, I can I can do some digging. I don't know if there is specifically for C Sharp, but um, I can take a look and see. Um, yeah. And it looks like Jose and Suresh both say that they like the session and these types of sessions. That's really good to know. Thank you for that feedback. So we can do, you know, in the upcoming future, when maybe in the next big model builder release, we can do this as well um, and talk about what we're working on, the progress that we've had. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else That's from. Not nice. <laughs> Sorry, Siri. Siri really likes to interrupt a lot in my meetings. Um, I see. think just just to add, you know, I'm 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 really passionate about 
responsible AI and making sure that, you know, once you train your models that you're not, you know, inadvertently or maybe sometimes intentionally, you know, people, people have, have biases and we want to make sure that, you know, when you're training your models, that you, you don't accidentally introduce those biases to your models or that other biases don't get introduced to your models. And so we, we want to make sure we're, we're setting you up uh, for success and you have the tools you need to, you know, analyze your models and understand if there's, if there's biases and give you the tools needed to correct those biases if, if you change your model in that way. Yep. So um, <laughs> lots of lots of really cool stuff there. And if if you happen to be something, uh, if you happen to be interested in this area as well, and you're doing any anything in this in this field or know of any other you know research we can we can leverage here, um, always looking for for new ways. We want to make sure that you know all of your ML and AI models that we make easy to easy to build are also responsible and easy to be responsible with. Yeah, uh, Jose said that. I miss Louise. We do too. <laughs> um, we were very sad when we heard that he wouldn't be able to make it, but he'll be on next time, hopefully. Um, so yeah, so we, we feel that. <laughs> um, Roberto said that we suggested that we update the roadmap. Uh, yes. So that's actually on my to-do list. We are currently um, restructuring, reorganizing the ML.NET repo. So not the machine learning model builder repo, but the machine .NET slash machine learning repo. So we will clean all of that up. Um, we'll add milestones. We'll um, add where I'm updating the roadmap and we're going through all triaging through all the issues and adding different labels and stuff to seeing, just trying to revamp the process to make it more efficient. <laughs> um, and so that you all know that what we're working on. So yeah, that's a great suggestion, Roberto. Um, Ed King 26, what is tensorflow.keras? Um, so tensorflow.net, and I'll share my screen for this. Um, this was the evaluation here. So tensorflow.net are C-sharp bindings on top of TensorFlow, which is a Python-based deep learning framework. Um, tensorflow.keras is this, so if you read here, um, this tensorflow.net project has this built-in Keras high-level interface, which is this in, which they release as tensorflow.keras. So if you don't know what Keras is, um, that's kind of a high-level um, API that you can use on top of TensorFlow um, so that it's uh, kind of like how we have our um, AutoML on top of ML.net, although this isn't an uh, this is not an implementation of AutoML. It's just meant to make uh, building neural networks simpler. Um, so this is TensorFlow.net's version of Keras, essentially. And move back here. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answered your question there. And I think we've answered all the questions. Um, I feel like there is one thing. Oh, a few sessions, a few stand-ups ago, I went over some of the top learnings that we had from the survey. Because uh, we we do a big survey every year, we had over we had about 900 responses, and in the blog post that I've been talking about, that's going to come out next week, um, I'll have this information there. But some of the top blockers, and again, mentioned this in the previous stand up, but some of the biggest pain points or blockers that people said was small ML.NET community, um, docs and samples, insufficient deep learning support, um, and afraid Microsoft will abandon it. So. In the blog post, I do list some of the things and efforts that we're doing to um, alleviate some of these pain points and challenges. We've talked about the deep learning support, um, docs and samples. We've already got some more resources on that to, to update and add more samples and, and you know make sure that they're up to date and relevant. Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of walk through each of these in the blog post. Um, just so you know, you know when we do surveys and we, we gather feedback, we actually wanna act on that feedback. Um, and so, yeah, so that will be in the next blog post, and we can talk about it in upcoming office hours or stand-ups as well. Um, yeah, so I think with that, we're, we're at the end of time. If you have any other questions, uh, either save them for the next one or reach out on Twitter or LinkedIn or, um, or our GitHub repo. Uh, we're always happy to chat. Um, yeah, Jake, any last parting words? I don't think so. Just, I mean, you, you heard us reiterate a bunch to, to file issues in our repo. We we res like to respond to that feedback. So so please do it. That's how we're going to you know advance our product and, and know which direction to head in next. Uh, so excited to hear from you guys. Yeah, and Thank we'll you. see you all at uh, Jake's after party. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you next time. Bye.